Hello, everyone. My name is Anne Haddad, and I am the historian at the Merchant's House Museum. Welcome to our series, Women Who Dared, 19th Century American Women Writers. For background about the purpose and theme of this series, please stay tuned following the story. Today, I will read a short story entitled The Two Offers, written in 1859 by Francis Watkins Harper. This is the first published short story written by an African-American writer. It appeared in the June and July 1859 issue of the Anglo-African magazine. Born in 1825 in Baltimore to free African-American parents, Harper was raised by an uncle who ran the Academy for Negro Youth in Baltimore. There, she received a classical education and became a teacher and later a woman's rights activist and staunch abolitionist. She traveled and lectured widely and wrote many novels, short fiction and poetry. She contributed to many anti-slavery newspapers and is known today as the mother of African-American journalism. She died in 1911. The two offers is unique in Harper's body of work because although one of the characters is an abolitionist, abolition is not the theme of the story and the protagonists are not identified as black women, but it does treat another form of repression that of a woman in a disastrous marriage. And also, see if you can spot Harper's tribute to a famous female literary figure. What is the matter with you, Laura, this morning? I have been watching you this hour, and in that time you have commenced a half dozen letters and torn them all up. What matter of such grave moment is puzzling your dear little head that you do not know how to decide? Well, it is an important matter. I have two offers for marriage and I do not know which one to choose. I should accept neither, or to say the least, not at present. Why ever not? Because, I think a woman who is undecided between two offers has not love enough for either to make a choice. And in that very hesitation, indecision, she has a reason to pause and seriously reflect, lest her marriage, instead of being an affinity of souls or a union of hearts, should only be a mere matter of bargain and sale or an affair of convenience and selfish interest. But I consider them both very good offers, just as many a girl would gladly receive. But to tell you the truth, I do not think that I regard either as a woman should the man she chooses for her husband. But then if I refuse, there is the risk of being an old maid. And that is not to be thought of. Well, suppose there is. Is that the most dreadful fate that can befall a woman? Is there not more intense wretchedness in an ill-assorted marriage, more utter loneliness in a loveless home than in the lot of the old maid who accepts her earthly mission as a gift from God and strives to walk the path of life with earnest and unfaltering steps. <laughs> what a little preacher you are. I really believe that you were cut out for an old maid, that when nature formed you, she put in a double portion of intellect to make up for a deficiency of love. And yet you are kind and affectionate but I do not think that you know anything of the grand overmastering passion or the deep necessity of woman's heart for loving. Do you think so? 
resume the first speaker and bending over her work, she quietly applied herself to the knitting that had lain neglected by her side during this brief conversation. But as she did so, a shadow flitted over her pale and intellectual brow, a mist gathered in her eyes and a slight quivering of the lips revealed a depth of feeling to which her companion was a stranger. But before I proceed with my story, let me give you a slight history of the speakers. They were cousins who had met life under different auspices. Laura Lagrange was the only daughter of a rich and indulgent parent who had spared no pains to make her an accomplished lady. Her cousin, Jeanette Alston, was the child of parents rich only in goodness and affection. Her father had been unfortunate in business and dying before he could retrieve his fortunes, left his business in an embarrassed state. His widow was unacquainted with his business affairs and when the estate was settled, hungry creditors had brought their claims and the lawyers had received their fees, she found herself homeless and almost penniless and she who had been sheltered in the warm clasp of loving arms found them too powerless to shield her from the pitiless pelting storms of adversity. Year after year, she struggled with poverty and wrestled with want till her toil-worn hands became too feeble to hold the shattered cords of existence and her tear-dimmed eyes grew heavy with the slumber of death. Her daughter had watched over her with untiring devotion, had closed her eyes in death and gone out into the busy, restless world missing a precious tone from the voices of earth, a beloved step from the paths of life. Too self-reliant to depend on the charities of relations, she endeavored to support herself by her own exertions and she had succeeded. Her path for a while was marked with struggle and trial, but instead of uselessly pining, she met them bravely and her life became not a thing of ease and indulgence, but of conquest, victory, and accomplishments. At the time when this conversation took place, the deep trials of her life had passed away. The achievements of her genius had won her a position in the literary world, where she shone as one of its bright particular stars. And with her fame came a competence of worldly means, which gave her leisure for improvement and the riper development of her rare talents. And she, that pale intellectual woman, whose genius gave life and vivacity to the social circle, had at one period of her life known the mystic and solemn strength of an all-absorbing love. Years faded into the past, had seen the kindling of her eye, the quick flushing of her cheek, and the wild throbbing of her heart, at tones of a voice long since hushed to the stillness of death. Deeply, wildly, passionately she had loved. Her whole life seemed like the pouring out of rich, warm, and gushing affections. This love quickened her talents, inspired her genius, and threw over her life a tender and spiritual earnestness. And then came a fearful shock, a mournful waking. A shadow fell across her path. It came between her and the object of her heart's worship. First, a few cold words, estrangement, and then, a painful separation, the old story of a woman's pride, and then a new made grave, and thus faded out from that young heart, her bright, brief, and saddened dream of life. Faint and spirit broken, she turned from the scenes associated with the memory of the loved and lost, pressing back the bitter sobs from her almost breaking heart, her genius gathered strength from suffering and wondrous power and brilliance 
from the agony she hid within the desolate chambers of her soul. Men hailed her as one of Earth's strangely gifted children and wreathed the garlands of fame for her brow. They breathed her name with applause when through the lonely halls of her stricken spirit was a deep, deep yearning for sympathy and heart support. But life with its stern realities met her, its solemn responsibilities confronted her and turning with an earnest and shattered spirit to life's duties and trials, she found a calmness and strength that she had only imagined in her dreams of poetry and song. We will now pass over a period of 10 years and the cousins have met again in that calm and lovely woman in whose eyes is a depth of tenderness tempering the flashes of her genius whose looks and tones are full of sympathy and love we recognize the once smitten and stricken Jeanette Alston. The bloom of her girlhood had given way to a higher type of spiritual beauty, as if some unseen hand had been polishing and refining the temple in which her lovely spirit found its habitation. Her inner life had grown beautiful, and it was this that was constantly developing the outer. Never in the early flush of womanhood had she appeared so interesting as when, with a countenance which seemed overshadowed with the spiritual light, she bent over the deathbed of a young woman just lingering at the shadowy gates of the unseen land. Has he come? Faintly but eagerly exclaimed the dying woman. Oh, how I have longed for his coming, and even in death he forgets me. Oh, do not say so, dear Laura. Some accident may have detained him, said Jeanette to her cousin, for on that bed from whence she will never rise lies the once beautiful and light-hearted Laura Lagrange, the brightness of whose eyes has long since been dimmed with tears and whose voice has become like a harp whose every chord is turned to sadness. A heavy hand was laid upon her once warm and bounding heart and a voice came whispering through her soul that she must die. But to her, the tidings was a message of deliverance, a voice hushing her wild sorrows to the calmness of resignation and hope. Life had grown so weary upon her head, she had no wish to tread again the track where thorns had pierced her feet and clouds overcast her sky. And she hailed the coming of death's angel as the footsteps of a welcome friend. And yet, Earth had one object so very dear to her weary heart. It was her absent and recreant husband. For since that conversation 10 years earlier, she had accepted one of her offers and become a wife. But before she married, she learned that great lesson of human experience and woman's life, to love the man who bowed at her shrine, a willing worshiper. He had a pleasing address, raven hair, flashing eyes, a voice of thrilling sweetness, and lips of persuasive eloquence. And being well-versed in the ways of the world, he won his way to her heart, and she became his bride, and he was proud of his prize. Vain and superficial in his character, he looked upon marriage not as a divine sacrament for the soul's development, but as the title deed that gave him possession of the woman he thought he loved. But alas for her, the laxity of his principles had rendered him unworthy of the deep and undying devotion of a pure-hearted woman. But for a while, 
he hid from her his true character and she blindly loved him and for a short period was happy in the consciousness of being beloved. Though sometimes a vague unrest would fill her soul when overflowing with the sense of the good, the beautiful and the true, she would turn to him but find no response to the deep yearnings of her soul. Their souls never met and soon she found a void in her bosom that his earthborn love could not fill. He did not satisfy the wants of her mental and moral nature. Between him and her, there was no affinity of minds, no intercommunion of souls. Talk as you will of a woman's deep capacity for loving, of the strength of her affectional nature, I do not deny it. But will the mere possession of any human love fully satisfy all the demands of her whole being? Woman, the true woman, if you would render her happy, needs more than the mere development of her affectional nature. Her conscience should be enlightened, her faith in the truth and right established, scope given to her heaven endowed and God-given faculties. The true aim of female education should be not a development or of one or two, but all the faculties of the human soul. To trust the whole wealth of a woman's nature on the frail bark of human love may often be like trusting a cargo of gold and precious gems to a bark that has never battled with the storm or buffeted the waves. Is it any wonder then that so many life barks go down, paving the ocean of time with precious hearts and wasted hopes, that so many are stranded on the shoals of existence, mournful beacons and solemn warnings for the thoughtless, to whom marriage is a careless and hasty rushing together of the affections? Alas, that an institution so fraught with good for humanity should be so perverted and that state of life with, which should be filled with happiness become so replete with misery. And this was the fate of Laura LaGrange. For a brief period after her marriage, her life seemed like a bright and beautiful dream full of hope and radiance with joy. And then there came a change. He found other attractions that lay beyond the pale of home influences. The gambling saloon had power to win him from her side. He had lived in an element of unhealthy and unhallowed excitements. And the society of a loving wife, the pleasures of a well-regulated home, were enjoyments too tame for one who had honed his tastes by the pleasures of sin. There were charmed houses of vice built upon dead men's loves where amid the flow of song, laughter and wine and careless mirth, he would spend hour after hour forgetting the cheek that was paling through his neglect, heedless of the tear dimmed eyes peering anxiously into the dark, waiting or watching his return. The influence of old associations was upon him. In early life, home had been to him a place of ceilings and walls, not a true home built upon goodness, love and truth. It was a place where velvet carpets hushed its tread, where images of loveliness and beauty invoked into being by painter's art and sculptor's skill, pleased to the eye and gratified the taste, where magnificence surrounded his way and costly clothing adorned his person. But it was not the place for the true culture and right development of his soul. His father had been too much engrossed in making money and his mother in spending it in striving to maintain a fashionable position in society and shining in the eyes of the world 
to give the proper direction to the character of their wayward and impulsive son. His mother put beautiful robes upon his body, but left ugly scars upon his soul. She pampered his appetite, but starved his spirit. In his home, a love for the good, the true and right had been sacrificed at the shrine of fashion. That parental authority, which should have been preserved as a string of precious pearls, unbroken and unscattered, was simply the administration of chance. At one time, obedience was enforced by authority, at another time by flattery and promises, and just as often, it was not enforced at all. Oh, if we would trace the history of all the crimes that have overshadowed this sin-shrouded and sorrow-darkened world of ours, how many might be seen arising from the wrong home influences or the weakening of the home ties. But alas for the young wife, when her husband entered the arena of life, the voices from home did not linger around his path as angels of guidance about his steps. They were not like so many messages to invite him to deeds of high and holy worth. The memory of no sainted mother arose between him and deeds of darkness. The earnest prayers of no father arrested him in his downward course. And before a year of his married life had waned, his young wife had learned to wait and mourn his frequent and uncalled for absence. More than once had she seen him come home from his midnight haunts, the bright intelligence of his eye displaced by the drunken stare and his manly gait changed to the inebriate stagger. And she was beginning to know the bitter agony that is compressed in the mournful words, a drunkard's wife. And then there came a bright but brief episode in her experience. The angel of life gave to her existence a deeper meaning and loftier significance. She sheltered in the warm clasp of her loving arms, a dear babe, a precious child, whose love filled every chamber of her heart and felt the fount of maternal love gushing so new within her soul. That child was hers. How overshadowing was the love with which she bent over its helplessness. How much it helped to fill the void and chasm in her soul. How many lonely hours were beguiled by its winsome ways, its answering smiles and fond caresses. How exquisite and solemn was the feeling that thrilled her heart when she clasped the tiny hands together and taught her dear child to call God, our father. What a blessing was that child. The father paused in his headlong career, awed by the strange beauty and precocious intellect of his child. And the mother's life had a better expression through her ministrations of love. And then there came hours of bitter anguish, shading the sunlight of her home and hushing the music of her heart. The angel of death bent over the couch of her child and beaconed it away. Closer and closer, the mother strained her child to her wildly heaving breast and struggled with the heavy hand that lay upon its heart. Love and agony contended with death but death was stronger than love and mightier than agony and won the child. And the poor stricken mother sat down beneath the shadow of her mighty grief, feeling as if a great light had gone out from her soul and that the sunshine had suddenly faded around her path. She turned in her deep anguish to the father of her child. For a while, his words were kind and tender, his heart seemed subdued, and his tenderness fell upon her worn and weary heart like rain on perishing flowers or cooling waters to lips all parched with thirst and scorched with fever. But the change was evanescent. 
the influence of unhallowed associations and evil habits had poisoned the springs of his existence. They had bound him in their meshes and he lacked the moral strength to break his fetters and stand erect in all the strength and dignity of a true manhood. And yet moments of deep contrition would sweep over him when he would resolve to abandon the wine cup forever, when he was ready to forswear the handling of another card and he would try to break away from the associations that he felt were working his ruin. But when the hour of temptation came, his strength was weakness. His earnest purposes were cobwebs, his well-meant resolutions, ropes of sand. And thus passed year after year, the married life of Laura LaGrange. She tried to hide her agony from the public gaze, to smile when her heart was almost breaking. But year after year, her voice grew fainter and sadder. Her once light and bouncing step grew slower and faltering. Year after year, she wrestled with agony and strove with despair till the quick eyes of her brother read in the paling of her cheek and the dimming eye, the secret anguish of her worn and weary spirit. On that wan, sad face, he saw the death tokens, and he knew the dark wing of the mystic angel swept coldly around her path. Laura, said her brother to her one day, you are not well, and I think you need our mother's tender care and nursing. You are daily losing strength, and if, and if you go, I will accompany you. At first, she hesitated. She shrank almost instinctively from presenting that pale, sad face to the loved ones at home. That face was such a telltale. It told of heart sickness, of hope deferred, and the mournful story of unrequited love. But then a deep yearning for home sympathy woke within her, a passionate longing for love's kind words, for tenderness and heart support. And she resolved to seek the home of her childhood and lay her weary head upon her mother's bosom to be folded again in her loving arms. A kind welcome awaited her. All that love and tenderness could devise was done to bring the bloom to her cheek and the light to her eye. But it was all in vain. Hers was a disease that no medicine could cure, no earthly balm would heal. It was a slow wasting of the vital forces, the sickness of the soul. The unkindness and neglect of her husband lay like a leaden weight upon her heart and slowly oozed away its life drops. And where was he that had won her love and then cast it aside as a useless thing, who rifled her heart of its wealth and spread bitter ashes upon its broken altars? He was lingering away from her when the death damps were gathering on her brow, when his name was trembling on her lips, lingering away, when she was watching his coming, though the death films were gathering before her eyes and earthly things were fading from her vision. I think I hear him now, said the dying woman. Surely that, that is his step. But the sound died away in the distance. Again, she started from an uneasy slumber. That, that is his voice. I am so glad he has come. Tears gathered in the eyes of the sad watchers by that dying bed, for they knew that she was deceived. He had not returned. For her sake, they wished his coming. Slowly, the hours waned away, and then came the sad, soul-sickening thought that she was forgotten, forgotten in the last hour of human need forgotten when the spirit about to be dissolved paused for the last time on the threshold of existence, a weary watcher at the gates of death. The 
he has forgotten me. Again, she faintly murmured, and the last tears she would ever shed on earth sprung to her mournful eyes, and clasping her hands together in silent anguish, a few broken sentences issued from her pale and quivering lips. They were prayers for strength and earnest pleading for him who had desolated her young life by turning its sunshine to shadows, its smiles to tears. He has forgotten me, but I can bear it. The bitterness of death is past, and soon I hope to exchange the shadows of death for the brightness of eternity the rugged paths of life for the golden streets of glory and the care and turmoils of earth for the peace and rest of heaven. Her voice grew fainter and fainter. They saw the shadows that never deceive flit over her pale and faded face and knew that the death angel waited to soothe their weary one to rest. And amid the silent hush of their grief, the freed spirit, refined through suffering and brought into divine harmony through the spirit of the living Christ, passed over the dark waters of death as on a bridge of light over whose radiant arches hovering angels bent. They parted the dark locks from her marble brow closed the waxen lids over the once bright and laughing eye and left her to the dreamless slumber of the grave. Her cousin turned from that deathbed a sadder and wiser woman. She resolved more earnestly than ever to make the world better by her example, gladder by her presence, and to kindle the fires of her genius on the altars of universal love and truth. She had a higher and better object in all her writings than the mere acquisition of gold or acquirement of fame. She felt that she now had a high and holy mission on the battlefield of existence, that life was not given her to be flittered away in nonsense or wasted away in trifling pursuits. She would willingly espouse an unpopular cause, but not an unrighteous one. In her, the downtrodden slave found an earnest advocate. The flying fugitive remembered her kindness as he stepped cautiously through our Republic to gain his freedom, having broken the chains on which the rust of centuries had gathered. Little children learned to name her with affection. The poor called her blessed as she broke her bread to the pale lips of hunger. Her life was like a beautiful story, only it was clothed with the dignity of reality and invested with the sublimity of truth. No husband brightened her life with his love or shaded it with his neglect. No children nestling lovingly in her arms called her mother. No one appended Mrs. to her name. She was indeed an old maid not vainly striving to keep up an appearance of girlishness when departed was written on her youth, not vainly pining at the loneliness and isolation. The world was full of warm, loving hearts and her own beat in unison with them. Neither was she always sentimentally sighing for something to love. Objects of affection were all around her and the world was not so wealthy in love that it had no use for hers. In blessing others, she made a life and benediction, and as old age descended peacefully and gently upon her, she had learned one of life's most precious lessons, that true happiness consists not so much in the fruition of our wishes as in the regulation of desires and the full development and right culture of our whole statures. Did you guess that Jeanette Alston was the author's tribute to Jane Austen? 
again, there is so much to talk about in this story. So I do hope that you write down your questions and comments and join me on April 8th at 6 p.m. for our virtual discussion and Q&A with Elaine Showalter. Please go to www.merchantshouse.org slash calendar to register for this free event. We shall continue our series with the short story by Louisa May Alcott, which is most certainly not a girl's story. So please join me. Thank you so much for being with me today and until next time. Hello everyone. My name is Annie Haddad and I am the historian at the Merchant's House Museum. It is my great pleasure in honor of Women's History Month to welcome you to our new series, Women Who Dared, 19th Century American Women Writers. In this series of short stories, we will explore how women writers of this period give voice to the pressing issues that were facing women by pulling back the curtains that shrouded their lives to reveal the harsh realities of life in the home and in American society. Defying convention by invading the traditional masculine domain of literature, these writers use their narratives to lay bare the pervasive marginalization of women who were restricted by what was called the cult of true womanhood, of which the prized virtues were piety, submissiveness, domesticity, and purity. They also boldly raised questions about racism and prejudice within the society. While being told to suffer in silence and given constant reminders of their imposed inferiority, many women felt trapped and unfulfilled and hungered for recognition of their plight. As a result, these female writers were critical and commercial successes, despite the largely dismissive attitude of writers and critics. For example, in 1855, a resentful Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote to his publisher, America is now wholly given over to a damned mob of scribbling women and I should have no chance of success while the public is occupied with their trash. Many of these innovative feminist themed stories appeared in the popular periodicals of the day, such as Godey's Ladies Book, Peterson's, and the Atlantic Monthly, and in popular gift books and literary annuals, where they were probably read by the Treadwell women who occupied the home on 4th Street that today we know as the Merchant's House Museum. Since the letters in the museum archives provide little information about the inner lives of Eliza Treadwell and her six daughters, we may read these stories and wonder whether or not they shared the experiences and thoughts expressed within them. Now, after being largely excluded from the American literary canon for a large part of the 20th century, the rise of women's studies programs and attention to feminist literature led to a renewed appreciation of these authors and their works. The renowned literary and feminist scholar Elaine Showalter edited two of the anthologies from which my story selection was taken. I am thrilled to inform you that on April 8th, Dr. Showalter, Professor Emeritus of Princeton University, will be joining us for a virtual discussion and Q&A. Dr. Showalter has written extensively on the short story form as a tool by which women writers could express the circumstances of women's lives. Her expert insights will surely enliven our discussion, so I do hope you join us for that event. 
Now, you probably have not heard of most of the writers in this series. In that case, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to them. Before we begin our first story, I would like to recite one stanza of a poem by Anne Bradstreet titled Prologue. Considered to be one of the most important early American poets, Bradstreet was the first writer to be published in the North American colonies. A mother of eight, she wrote many poems that addressed her domesticity, her Puritan faith, and her struggles to remain committed to her writing despite the confining role she was assigned to by virtue of her sex. In prologue written in 1650, Bradstreet reflects with a mixture of anger and sarcasm on how society rejects the idea that a woman may have creative impulses. I am obnoxious to each carping tongue who says my hand a needle better fits. A poet's pen all scorn I should thus wrong. For such despite they cast on female wits. If I do prove well, it won't advance. They'll say it's stolen or else it was by chance. Thank you. 